I hereby open this Committee on Governmental Operations, uh, sorry, on <laughs> contracts uh, and uh, food procurement in the uh, City of New York. Uh, Council Member uh, Ben Kalos and I am the Chair of the Contracts Committee. I'm the former Chair of the Governmental Operations. It's hard to get that out of your blood. Uh, but uh, Gail Brewer was also the Chair. and. Uh, we wanted to start with a special thank you to Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. I can say thank yous because she's not currently in the room, and if she was, she'd be making faces at me, so it's, it's good. Uh, she sponsored Local Law 50 of 2011 uh, during her time in the City Council, and uh, that, is a, that combined with Local Law 52 of 2011, which was sponsored by then council member, now assembly member Inez Dickens, two of my two favorite elected officials uh, whose impacts we're going to discuss today. Uh, we are joined today by uh, committee members Kalman Yeager and uh, Bill Perkins, uh, who is actually uh, uh, works very closely with Inez, with Inez Dickens, uh, and, ha and they, they have shared their seat together. Uh, and I want to thank them and uh, apologize for being a little late to start this. We were actually doing a hearing on universal after school in the council chambers, uh, which included legislation that I am sponsoring. Uh, and I think that these hearings actually complement each other quite well. Since, at, uh, and for those who are part of the press or even in the audience, if you have questions that you would like me to ask or you'd like to otherwise participate in the hearing, whether you're in the room or live streaming it or watching it on TV, feel free to tweet me at Ben Kalos or on any other social media platform. Since at least 2011, the Council has worked alongside our partners in the food and equity community to ensure that wherever possible city agencies choose to purchase local food from New York. Speaker Johnson and his predecessor, Speakers Mark Viverito and Quinn, have all worked closely with advocates in the food policy community toward achieving that goal. Through the leadership of Borough President Brewer, uh, the Council passed Local Laws 50 and 52 back in 2011, which enabled city agencies to develop guidelines for price preferences for certain New York food products identified by the New York State Commissioner of Agriculture and Markets. These products include a variety of New York produce such as milk, fresh, frozen, and canned fruits and vegetables, uh, grains, fresh or canned fish products, nuts and nut butters, jams, jellies, preserves, and cheeses, just to name a few. The mechanism for the price preference for those products equates to a 10% preferred equivalent to the standard lowest competitive sealed bid. In practice, this means all other things being equal, if a responsible bidder from outside New York State were to offer a price of a dollar for a bushel of apples, and the same bidder from New York State were to offer a dollar ten for the same type of apples, then the price preference would make them functionally equivalent for the purpose of competitive bidding. This preference for New York food products is explicitly authorized by the New York State General Municipal Law as well as the state's finance law. While I applaud the efforts made by the administration in support of procuring local food over the last few years, more remains to be done in terms of gathering information regarding the success or failure of this price preference program. One of the key components of Local Law 50 was an annual report on food procured from local sources in the prior fiscal year. For each of the last three fiscal years, only a handful of food vendors even responded with information regarding their local food procurement numbers. In fiscal year 2019, for example, only nine out of 97 vendors responded. It is difficult for us as the oversight body of the city or for local food advocates and the public to make any meaningful conclusions about the success of local food procurement efforts at city agencies if the data regarding those efforts is unavailable. Speaker Johnson included a variety of goals in support of local food in his food equity plan. These include support for urban agriculture and community gardens, as well as farm to city projects and a good food purchasing plan. In order to achieve those goals, data regarding where and from whom the city is purchasing its food needs to be paramount. It is extremely difficult to support those types of initiatives without relevant information. I'd also like to note uh, that we were able to pass, uh, since I've been a council member, I've also been focused on food. Uh, it's strange to learn what you end up caring about when you're an elected official and you have only one resource and that's time. And we passed Local Law 215 of 2017. That was a very busy year. 
and that required the Department of Education to report on all the different types of food available in all different types of schools and whether it's canned or not. And we've been working with DOE on that report. And between uh, Manhattan Borough President's Local Law 50 report and our Local Law 215 report, we're hoping to get a good picture of the food that we are serving in our city. Today we hope to hear more about what efforts are being made by the administration to encourage food suppliers to include information about local food procurement. We plan to hear from the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, and the Department of Education's Office of School Food in the efforts they have made to improve the amount of local food they purchase and what, if anything, we as a council can do towards improving the amount of food procured from local sources. I'd like to uh, thank our Contracts Committee staff, Legislative Council Alex Polina, Policy Analyst Casey Addison, and Finance Unit Head John Russell, uh, as well as uh, Peter uh, from our committee staff, and my Chief of Staff Jesse Towson, Legislative Director Wilfredo Lopez for their work on this hearing, as uh, well as Shulamit Warren from the Office of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, without whom none of this would be happening. Finally, we will be hearing from the administration uh, in addition to uh, our Manhattan Borough President, who will uh, share uh, some remarks about compliance with that legislation. Uh, that being said, I'd like to now instruct the, uh, uh, I'd like to ask the administration to please come up. If you can please state your names and titles uh, and favorite local food for the record. And uh, then we will swear you in. Uh, we just don't want to make sure anyone is sworn to any particular type of food. Good afternoon, committee. My name is Ryan Murray. I'm first deputy of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services. And uh, as I may have shared before, uh, I really like potatoes. Hello, I'm Victor Olds, also of the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, General Counsel, and my favorite item would have to be apples. Good afternoon, I'm Kate McKenzie, Director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. I'm going to go with stone fruits, particularly nectarines and peaches. And uh, just out of the uh, fair play, I'm a big fan of Greek yogurt made from cows right here in New York and made right here in New York by uh, one brand in particular, which I, I, I favor, but if anyone else is, please feel free to tweet us, and we'll, and we'll give you credit where it's due, but one of them is Chobani, and, and that's how I start every day. We've been joined by Council Member Helen Rosenthal, and we'll now swear you in. Would you please raise your right hand? If you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today, and to respond honestly to Council Member questions. I do. Thank you. You may begin. Again, good afternoon, Chair Kalos. Uh, I will give my greetings to the borough president uh, and to members of the contracts committee. Thank you for inviting us to discuss local food procurement. I am Ryan Murray again, uh, first deputy director for the mayor's office of contract services or MOX. MOX functions as both an oversight and service agency with a goal to ensure transparency, fairness, timeliness and efficiency in New York City procurement. In the execution of our duties, we collaborate with policy leaders with expertise in various subject areas and coordinate across agencies to facilitate responsiveness to procedural and reporting requirements. To increase the effectiveness of citywide procurement, MOX is also leading a multi-year initiative to overhaul and modernize our approach to agency vendor relationship management. This project leverages technology to make it easier to do business for all stakeholders, reduces administrative burdens historically experienced in a heavily paper-based practice, and makes data more readily available and understandable to inform policy making. MOX understands and takes seriously the city's effort to procure food that is fresh, nutritious, and sourced locally. Under New York City General Municipal Law 103, city agencies have procurement tools at their disposal to enable sourcing of New York State produced foods. For example, agencies may utilize price preference for bids that provide food grown or produced in New York and come from within 10% of the lowest responsive and responsible bidder. MOX provided guidance on these regulations to agencies to help increase their purchase of New York State food products. 
As part of Local Law 50 of 2011, MOX publishes an annual report detailing the city's performance with regards to local food procurements in the preceding fiscal year. To fulfill this requirement, MOX conducts a, a review to determine the number of contracts which exceed the small purchase limit of 100,000. MOX works with agencies to identify those contracts with a food component exceeding 100,000, along with corresponding vendors for those contracts. MOX subsequently sends a voluntary survey to the relevant vendors. The survey focuses on vendor food sourcing for each month of the past fiscal year across 91 individual food items. Vendors are asked whether they purchased this food during the reporting period, and data are collected on the total value of purchases, as well as the monthly breakdown. Vendors also account for information related to each individual item and the sources of its purchase, either from within or outside New York State. Next, vendors compare the itemized monthly purchases against New York State availability periods that are provided in the survey for each food item. These columns flag instances where the vendor sourced outside New York State when the, that product was available in state, and this serves to encourage identification of additional opportunities for local sourcing. Because the law requires purchasing information for 91 individual food items on a monthly basis and for, for in-state and out-of-state purchases, this can ultimately lead to vendors to fill out several thousand fields of data points. The FY19 report shows nine vendors completed responses that were returned to MOX. This low response rate is consistent with our experience over many years administering the survey with our agency partners. We have identified several challenges to administering the survey. First, vendors are not required to complete the survey as part of Local Law 50. The voluntary nature of the survey means that few vendors feel compelled to go through the extra work of collecting this information from their own suppliers in addition to other core service delivery priorities. Second, the perceived burden of completing the survey discourages potentially engaged vendors from participating. Pulling data for this many fields and situations where it is not always readily available burdens providers who do not consistently track this information. Many vendors do not anticipate filling out the survey at the beginning of a new contract, so they do not track the appropriate data throughout the year, requiring them to do so retroactively at the end of the reporting period. Additionally, this process entails an extra layer of complexity for human service providers who are really contracted to provide food directly and typically procure foods from external parties themselves. They lack complete information on the sourcing patterns of their subcontractors or suppliers and may have few tools at their disposal to encourage information provision. As a result, they are unable to quickly or reliably complete the survey. We share the Council's goals of increasing transparency into sourcing decisions by vendors and increasing the city's procurement from local producers. We furthermore acknowledge that MOCs can take some internal steps to improve the response rate and the quality of information provided in this report. In the long run, the transition to a digitized environment will enable consistent tracking of contracts subject to Local Law 50 and allow us to link these contracts to invoicing, which gives a clear view into how much was budgeted and what ultimately was spent. In the meantime, we recognize the pressing need to increase transparency into New York food sourcing and have identified several steps to improve collection of this data in the short term. One immediate change we can make is to administer the survey more frequently. This would give vendors a clearer signal of what information we will consistently request while making it easier for them to complete the survey on a shorter reporting period. Additionally, we have greatly improved our capacity to engage with vendors and foster ongoing conversations in recent years. We can utilize collaborative working groups such as the Nonprofit Resiliency Committee to find ways to better tailor the survey to vendors, ongoing operations, and spur greater participation. Finally, we can enhance the suite of food policy resources we offer to give vendors a clearer picture of the information we require and what steps they can take to support this reporting. In partnership with the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, we can also offer guidance on how vendors can better track food production locations and sorting, sourcing patterns of their suppliers. While we're open to discussing new ways to improve data quality on citywide food sourcing, we also believe that these efforts should be informed by the full context of initiatives underway, such as the implementation of Passport, the Procurement and Sourcing Solutions Portal by MOX, and several local food programs 
the Mayor's Office of Food Policy is currently undertaking. Passport will allow MOCs and other agencies to have a far greater degree of transparency into procurement processes than we have been able to achieve previously. This will give us fuller view into specific types of procurements, vendors' historical performance, and potentially what sourcing decisions they are making. It will also make data collection substantially easier by allowing us to capture relevant information from the outset rather than manually entering it from vendors and gives us a view into real-time activity. For example, release two of Passport, which was launched in April 2019 in partnership with the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, or DCAS, allows us to track food purchases from, and payment from those goods. A quick glance at data indicated that since launch, approximately 19 agencies have spent roughly $4 million on food across 85 DCAS requirements contracts held by 31 vendors. We're already seeing the benefits from investment in digital transformation as our data collection is more effective and information is more readily available in greater levels of detail than before. Over time, if, if we take steps to enhance records for these items and those purchased by vendors with service contracts, we will eliminate the need to survey vendors because data will be captured as part of the regular course of business. As we launch our next major release, our phase for Passport, which enables sourcing activity by agencies and enhances our capacity for data analysis, we will be better positioned to share global and nuanced insights around food purchasing. We're also seeing positive signs from several agencies who are uh, pushing to increase local food procurement. DCAS includes price preference for locally sourced foods in all food-related solicitations they release. As the agency responsible for goods purchasing for all mayoral agencies, this has a significant impact on food sourcing by the city. The imp they implement a robust quality assurance check to validate the accuracy of sourcing information provided by their vendors, a practice which could become a model for other food procuring agencies and are looking at ways to require sourcing a source reporting by vendors in their next wave of food related uh, contracts. Between fiscal 16 and 19, DCAS awarded nearly 44 million in contracts for New York's source food items, which amounts to about 22% of all food items procured by DCAS. The Department of Education, or DOE, has also made great strides in delivering an increasing share, an increasing share of healthy, locally produced foods to students. As the largest food purchaser in the city, DOE has implemented several practices to provide locally grown food to students and staff, including New York Thursdays, the Garden to Cafe program that introduces students to raising their own produce, and the inclusion of local preference languages, language in all bids. There is more work to be done, but current efforts underway at agencies like DOE are actively increasing, improving the city's local food procurement efforts. I'm joined by both DCAS and DOE today. We share the same goal of verifying and increasing the sourcing of New York State food. At this time, the best mechanism we have seen for collecting and ensuring the integrity of this data is through the direct inspection of goods, as DCAS has shown us. We will do our best to devise appropriate measure, measures to improve the response rate for local law 50 report, but we ultimately believe, believe that the transition to a digital environment will provide new mechanisms for tracking this data more closely to the point of origin while reducing the administrative burden for agencies and vendors. We're also encouraged by efforts to partner with food policy experts who have led similar discussions in other jurisdictions and are happy to support our food policy director in convening agencies to align efforts. Ultimately, these efforts pave the way for healthier, more sustainable, sustainable and locally grown food sourcing for the city government. We look forward to continuing this discussion with the committee and the borough, and borough president Brewer. I will now turn it over to the Mayor's Office of Food Policy Director, Kate McKenzie, who will elaborate further on some of the key initiatives underway to help achieve our shared goals. Uh, in, in between your testimonies, I just want to acknowledge we've been uh, joined by Councilmember Barron. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Chairperson. And members of the Committees on Contracts. My name is Kate McKenzie, and I am the Director of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. 
Thank you for the opportunity to testify on the administration's commitment to good food procurement and the plans in place to create a values-based food system that reflects the administration's values of equity, health, and sustainability. Before I begin, and even though she's not here, I really want to appreciate and thank Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer for her steadfast commitment to improving food access, food quality, and local food economies. I also appreciate the Council's efforts to improve access to healthy food for all New York City communities. During my testimony, I will outline the commitment we have made to implement a good food purchasing policy across key constituent food serving agencies, providing a transparent, metrics-based, flexible framework that encourages large institutions to direct their buying power toward five core values, local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare, and nutrition. Applying these principles in the work to purchase food through agencies will help increase the consumption of high quality, nutritious food and increase knowledge of the desirability of healthy food. New York City provides 238 million meals a year to some of New York's most vulnerable populations. The food budgets to support these meals are more than $400 million. The non-mayoral agencies of the Department of Education and Health and Hospitals procure food directly. The Department of Citywide Administrative Services procures food on behalf of the Human Resources Administration, the Administration for Children's Services, the Department of Correction, and the New York City Police Department. The Department for the Aging and the Department for Homeless Services each procure food through their own agencies. Regardless of the mechanism of food procurement used, each of these agencies is participating in the Good Food Purchasing Program. New York City was the first major city in the country to set nutrition standards for all foods purchased or served by the city. The food standards were created with the goal of improving the health of all New Yorkers served by city agencies by decreasing the risk of chronic disease related to poor nutritional intake. The standards have been strengthened through investments by this administration, and today, these standards apply to each of those 238 meals, million meals I mentioned above. Building on that legacy, the administration is committed to implementing a good food purchasing policy to ensure that whether it's a meal served in a homeless shelter, a prison, or a school, New Yorkers are receiving the highest quality food possible. Furthermore, we want to examine the larger supply chain to make sure that the city is doing business with vendors and suppliers that support the local economy and are responsible when it comes to their workforce and the environment. Food production is among the largest drivers of global environmental change and the country's sec second largest buyer of food, we have a leadership role to play by setting norms that can signal to the marketplace the types of products and conditions we want to support. We have opportunities to promote both healthy diets and more sustainable food choices through procurement. This commitment was made in last April's release of 1NYC. The Center for Good Food Purchasing provides planning, implementation, and evaluation support for institutions involved with the Good Food Purchasing Program. The program itself helps institutional food buyers shift their food purchases to reflect those five core values. Again, those are local economies, environmental sustainability, valued workforce, animal welfare, and nutrition. As a collaborative citywide initiative managed by the Mayor's Office of Food Policy, New York City is developing its own approach to integrate the GFP principles, ensuring that money spent on food serves both people and the planet. With support from a private foundation, we have contracted with the Center for Good Food Purchasing to support our efforts. Each agency that I mentioned above is currently involved in a rigorous and robust data collection process to examine current food purchasing practices. This information will determine existing alignment with the Good Food Purchasing Program standards in those five value categories. I'd like to give an example of the type of data that will be collected. A food service operations overview form will be completed for each agency that captures the total annual dollar amount of food and beverage purchases by product category and an average number of daily meals served. A nutrition self-assessment that examines healthful practices in procurement, food preparation, and the food service environment. A review of an inventory of suppliers with serious repeat and or willful health and safety and or wage and, and 
hour labor violations over the last three years that's generated by the center. A report of all line item records of actual food purchases made during the fiscal year that details the product description, including the city and state, if in the United States, the vendor, the supplier, the brand name, the true manufacturer of that product, the pack size, the quantity, the price per quantity, and the production location. Capturing this information is essential to build a deep understanding of the opportunities and responsibilities we have to shift procurements. This is an incredibly complex ask of vendors who are currently under no obligation to provide the information. We do know, however, that food industry trends are pointing to great transparency, traceability, and social responsibility. The private sector has been providing this level of detail based on consumer demand, and as a city, New York believes that it's time to do the same. Together with the Mayor's Office of Contract Services, DCAS, the Office of Management and Budget, and our legal counsel, we will be looking to change the language in our contracts to request this information. By making these contractual changes, we will be able to require vendors to report on product that is coming in from New York State. We can also be in a better position to set goals for these procurements. We are also exploring innovative contracts that may allow smaller farmers who may not produce quantities needed by the scale of our city to aggregate their products with intermediaries. It's our intention to use the public contracting process to create greater accountability along our supply chains by asking companies with whom we do business with for stronger commitments to transparency and our administration's values. With information from each agency, we will compete, complete an aggregate analysis of what the city's purchasing looks like and make strategic decisions on the areas to prioritize. This information, when analyzed, will give us a comprehensive overview of our current food sourcing so that we can set good food purchasing goals for the future. As a result, we will create a values-based food system that reflects the values of equity, health, and sustainability of this administration. This deepens our commitment to the Green New Deal, as outlined in one New York City. New York City is and will continue to be a national and international leader in how resources can be brought to bear in order to transform the food system and serve as a model to other jurisdictions looking to create greater equity through the food system for residents, communities, and the environment. While other jurisdictions have implemented the Good Food Purchasing Program, no city has done so as comprehensively as New York is intending to, truly working from the inside to transform not just the way we procure food, but to inspire dramatic shifts in our nation's food supply. With the shared goal of greater food equity, we look forward to working with the Council to strengthen Local Law 50 and to share our progress on the Good Food Purchasing Program efforts. Thank you for this opportunity to, te to testify, and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Thank you, and uh, thank you for already answering the first line of questions relating to your favorite food. Uh, in your testimony, you indicated uh, the agencies which procure food, uh, and I guess we were curious about, uh, so, so you indicated that uh, DCAS, so two non-mayoral agencies are procuring food that is not necessarily within your scope, so you have DOE and Health Plus hospitals, so that's school breakfast, lunch, snack, supper, and then I imagine in the hospital context, that's the food that's being served to patients in H plus H, is that correct? Yeah, the 11 public hospitals. And then so Department of Citywide Administrative Services, DCAS, they procure only for HRA, Administration for Children's Services, Department of Corrections, which operates Rikers and other facilities in our city, and then New York City Police Department. Uh, can you share what context that food is served? So we, we know that the corrections is served to folks who are awaiting trial uh, or who have misdemeanor sentences. Uh, can, you share, uh, can you share for HRA, ACS, and NYPD? Sure. HRA provides uh, meals through the Emergency Food Assistance Program, um, also through HIV um, and AIDS uh, meal distributions. Um, ACS provides meals through early learning sites. Um, you mentioned uh, DOCS and NYPD um, for uh, people in holding. 
And what about uh, Department of Health and Mental Hygiene? That was an agency we had flagged that we thought might be procuring food. Um, to my knowledge, they are not procuring uh, meals that actually serve uh, city residents, um, but we're happy to look into that further. These are the largest uh, constituent serving food purchasing agencies. Okay, does Mox have any information whether in Department of Health and Mental Hygiene uh, I, is serving? Sure, I don't have that data in front of me. I think perhaps what you might be referring to, uh, if it's not the directly delivered uh, foods, they may have contracts which are subject to local law 50, uh, where through the providers that they contract with, uh, there, there's food, a food component, which is one part of a larger contract. So we're happy to look into that for you uh, as a follow-up to this hearing. Okay, and then for the DCAS procurement, so we're talking Human Resources, Administration for Children's Services, Department of Corrections, New York NYPD, do you have a breakdown on how much of it is direct? So the agency is just going out there and then they're buying the food versus they have a contract. So in an early learn situation, they have a contract with the early learn provider and then they're asking that early learn provider to get the food instead, in which case they would be covered versus, uh, so yeah, do you have a breakdown I, versus? I can invite my colleagues from DCAS to respond. Hello. Uh, if you can share your, your name, your title, your favorite New York food, and then we will swear you in. Sure. Mercita Ibrick, Deputy Commissioner for Office of Citywide Procurement, and favorite New York uh, source food is tomatoes. Great. <laughs> Please raise your right hand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry? Please raise your right hand. Oh. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sorry. Yeah. Mercita Ibrick, <laughs> <laughs> Deputy Commissioner for Office of Citywide Procurement at DCAS. Do I have to repeat tomatoes? Uh, we, we, okay. that, we don't need you to swear to that. Uh, do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today? I do. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so uh, the question was, do we have a breakdown uh, for those particular agencies on how much of that food is uh, bulk purchases versus through their um, other service contracts? And the answer is I, we do not have that information on hand, but we could gladly follow up with that information. We'd have to contact those agencies directly. Okay. And then you, and then so DFTA does their own, as well as DHS, they do their own procurement. So uh, are DFTA or DHS doing direct yeah. purchasing or are they going through providers? Sure. Um, uh, DHS, or Department for Homeless Services, um, has a food budget of about $52 million. 17 of that is direct um, through a contractor or a caterer and $35.5 million goes direct to providers. Um, regarding DIFTA, Department for the Aging, it's about a $35 million food budget. $23 million goes to the congregate meal programs or specifically to providers. And then $42 million is to the caterers or contractors that provide home delivered meals. The, so far, as far as I understand, you can correct me if I'm wrong, DCAS has been the only agency that has been circulating the questionnaires in compliance with local law 50. Is that correct? Chair, so the, the way we circulate the, the uh, survey, DCAS circulates uh, the survey to its vendors. Those are food vendors. Uh, and then we work with the agencies to reach out to, uh, this is MOX, works with the agencies to reach out to the vendors with which they contract. Uh, so, so, but in terms of the, I get moving forward. Sure. Does the does the city plan to ask more than just DCAS to circulate this? So will will you be asking um, DHS and DIFTA to uh, circulate as well as uh, folks for which DCAS also? Sure. So I, I think moving forward, we, as I shared in my testimony, we are happy to implement a, a range of new uh, options from increasing frequency, working more closely with agencies, working with our partners in the nonprofit sector to get information out to, provider, to providers to try to increase the response rate on the survey. We're also, uh, as the food policy director shared, thinking about not just having folks uh, respond to a thousand items survey 
survey as the way to get information back, again, self-reported, not necessarily validated, um, but really working with folks in the good food policy world to think about other, whether it's sampling techniques, using technology we will, we to get, make that happen. We will talk about the technology in, in a moment. Okay. Then. But I think, yes, we will obviously do that, but uh, we, we want to get a much more robust picture that may come beyond just surveying folks and increasing outreach. In terms of the 238 million meals a year and the $400 million spent uh, as reported in the Food Metrics Report, uh, is this inclusive of all agencies, including non-mayoral, or is it only the DCAS agencies, or yeah. wh who are we talking about? This, is, this represents um, all of those agencies that are obviously part of the Good Food Purchasing Program, including Department of Education, including agent Health and Hospitals, um, including ACS, uh, the gamut of food serving agencies. And is this only for food light items or does it also include administration light items? This is for, fo uh, this is for food light items. I will say that there is, um, as my colleagues from the Department of Education can attest to, um, in some cases, uh, specifically with the Department of Education, there is a um, storage and distribution um, component that's added to the food budget. So if you're working with a distributor, they're ultimately um, storing and, and delivering that food to schools. So that would go into their contract, their food contract as well. So, so this is so. For instance, if we have a contract with a homeless service provider, and we're paying them, let's call it 300 million a year, and part of that is serving three square meals a day to folks, you've been able to break out what portion of that goes towards food. Um, so uh, specific with uh, DHS and DIFTA, those uh, food assessments are just getting underway. That is exactly the level of, d of granularity that we're looking to get. And, and, and uh, l lest you get, get there before I do, uh, the nature of the questions that you're seeking to answer relating to source of food and the type of tracking in terms of uh, vendor, true manufacturer, pack size, quantity, and so on and so forth, which I imagine has to do with folks being able to know whether or not their spinach is safe or not yep. and other food quality standards. I guess my, my question is versus these thousand question surveys that I think we all agree are a thing of the past, is there a way to let the computers do the work for us? For instance, I, I don't remember the last time I ordered something over the phone or even in paper. Uh, as far as I can remember, I usually just order everything online, and it's already been reported in the news that I use Amazon, uh, and, and I even have used uh, Fresh Direct or Instacart on occasion. I imagine a lot of the people who are procuring food do so through a digital interface, and when there's a digital interface, there can be an API where all somebody has to do is give you an API key, and then Passport could get the information automatically. Uh, is this something that the city can be doing, or is this something that you're already working on? That is certainly the desired state that we're aiming to get to. I think that it's a perfect alignment of, of Passport being operationalized and designed in the way that it is, and having um, this effort and commitment of good food purchasing occur at the same time. Um, in a future state, we would love to be able to identify any food item that the city is procuring and know all of the, the answers um, to all of those uh, specificities that I mentioned that we will be tracking. When Local Law 50 was authored and passed by now Borough President Gail Brewer, uh, yeah. we were taking advantage, she was taking advantage of a state law that allowed us that option. Uh, what has changed or what is happening differently that is allowing you to mandate the collection of this information versus only survey the collection? Yeah, I, th I think um, one of the things I, m I may do is ask my colleagues from DCAS to join us to talk about um, how they are uh, leveraging the tools available to, the, to us in procurement. Um, we are, well, you're, you're here, Marzita. Um, but we're, I think we are in the future procurement really trying to make sure that uh, we can include that as mandatory. This would be helpful for obviously 
the direct food vendors, we're being very, very thoughtful about how to not add any additional burdens onto nonprofits. I know we've had many a committee hearing, uh, whether in this committee or others, about uh, the litany of things that we require from uh, our human services vendors. So um, yes, that's one tool um, that we can use, in a, particularly with the direct purchasing. Um, maybe we can talk a little bit about that, um, but we're, we're also thinking, as you've uh, alluded to, in the previous question about using other tools to really get that information so that uh, it's not a burden to our human services colleagues. If the human services colleagues, for example, are working with a, a food supplier, for example, uh, that might be something that might be more readily obtained from their subcontract or supplier than it would be uh, from the food vendor. So that's something we might try to incorporate into uh, the contract. Yep, and so I can speak for our DCAS contracts, and so for um, for every line item that we purchase, we or that we are bidding out for, for sorry, um, there's a separate line item for New York State Source um, and an other, and so we're encouraging all of our bidders to provide us a price if the, if it's available uh, for both those items, and so that's one of the ways that we're collecting that information directly up front, um, so that we have that that data as opposed to just having to always survey after the fact. Thank you. That is my first round of. Uh questions. Uh, I'm going to turn to, uh, for questions to Council Member Barron, then Rosenthal. Uh, I may end up reserving my second round and we may just follow up with additional questions so that we can get our borough president up to testify. Over to Council Member Barron. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to the panel for coming. I just have a brief question. There was recently an article in the paper about uh, a number of people who lived in a homeless shelter who were sickened by food that was served to them reportedly from that shelter. What role uh, does MOX or DCAS or HRA or whomever play in making sure that the quality of food that's served to those persons in those facilities, whom, as we talk about people who are in prisons and in other restricted conditions, really don't have perhaps the voice or the opportunity to really make their issues and their cases known to get a resolution to that? I, so, uh, hello, Council Member. Nice to see you as always. Um, I may not uh, respond to that specific case in detail. Um, I, I think we're, uh, there, there's an active look at that, but I can talk ab uh, ask my colleague from DCAS uh, to talk about the inspection process that they use uh, for foods, foods that are purchased centrally on behalf of agencies, uh, which gives us more where there is. Uh, where we're concerned about health and safety overall when we're buying any goods, there's an inspection process that's put in place. So um, if you don't mind, I'm going to that's broaden right. the, the, the response to that specific uh, area. Absolutely. And I can talk about, so for DCAS, anything that we buy uh, through our citywide purchasing group is in, uh, that's a commodity is inspected, and that includes food. And that inspection happens uh, you know, at different stages of the procurement. It can happen at the beginning when we're trying to verify that, in fact, that the, the item that we're procuring or the vendor is bidding on is, in fact, the item that we requested. Uh, we're ensuring it at the point of delivery. And then if it ever becomes an issue, we also go back and we'll inspect that good again. So if, if for example, after an initial inspection or initial sampling, you know, a uh, uh, a client is saying that, you know, we're seeing something, something's not right here, we'll go back and we'll inspect again. So there are actually several points in the process where DCAS gets involved, and we have an entire bureau dedicated uh, to just inspection of our, all of our commodities. So how does a product that has a best buy date, which is expired, get served to people? So for, for DCAS contracts, we, we I, and I can't speak to the DHS e example, um, because that, those were not procured by, by, by DCAS. Um, but uh, for DCAS, what we would do is we always look at the date um, when it's delivered, and we give it a certain time frame. So it depends on the actual commodity itself. Certain foods are, you know, you want a longer shelf life. Certain foods go very quickly, and so it's okay that it's only going to be there for two weeks. But we do an, an analysis of it was received on this date. Here's the best by date. We're not going to accept it if it's too close. So the order itself has the best by date on it when it's ordered? It's, we, we inspect it at the point of delivery. And so we tell them when we need it by, we tell the vendor when we need the, the products by, and then at delivery, if the sell-by date is too soon, we will, we will return those items and require that the vendor 
resend uh, those. So you don't, as a policy, have a period of time by which you can say to the vendor, "Don't give us anything that will expire within uh, six months after delivery or something of that," depending on the shelf life of the product. So it's not a standard policy, but we do buy commodities have have certain criteria as to when. So for like, again, milk might have a shorter uh, time period versus uh, something that's, that's a, a part of the food. contract. Um, I do have, would have to check to see if that's okay. actually part of the contract. Thank you. Thank yep. you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Councilmember Rosenthal. Thank you so much, Chair Kalos, for holding this really important hearing. I appreciate it. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, um, I guess, primarily for, um, hang on, so many papers. Kate. Um, welcome. Thank you. It's nice to see you in this position. I've heard great things about you. Thank you. I'm really excited. I was reading your testimony, hearing you, and very much appreciating the good food policy. But one of the things that is always of interest to me is, you know, someone can say that they are the good food policy mayor, but does the budget or implementation reflect what it is that they're saying they're doing, right? So it's just some very basic practical questions. Okay. To the extent that good food policy, everything, you, the five elements that you define in there, costs more money than canned goods, processed goods, does the city increase the funding for those budgets to accommodate that cost? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question. I absolutely appreciate it. Um, you know, we're at the stages right now of looking at, you know, these five values and assessing them uh, based on the food procurements that we have specifically for fiscal 19, just to get the baseline picture of what does it look like. Um, and there are certain items, um, you know, certainly my colleagues at OMB um, are, are asking those questions as well. And it's premature to answer if food is going to cost more, what's, what are we going to be able to do within budget. Um, but we do know that some, you know, the, the purchasing power that this city has is tremendous. What we were able to do um, with the nutrition standards back even when DOE started to make some of those changes. Um, were, were changes that did not um, increase food costs and we're working to change the market um, to meet the demand of New York City. So we're going to be looking at all of that and making the appropriate decisions and certainly keeping council abreast of that. Well, uh, you know, just to sort of make the obvious point, the state, I guess, has a law that says, you yeah. know, there's an exception for fresh food and that exception is uh, allowing 10% yeah. above what is required through the general municipal law, which is lowest cost provider. Yeah. So by definition, the state is saying it's going to cost more, yeah. right? Yeah. And yeah. they're giving that allowance. Now, in truth, and, and your research is going to help answer this question, you know, is it 10%, is it 20%? We need to get our arms around that. And yes, I agree with you uh, that the costs should be lower. I mean, a plant-based diet could be lower in cost than a, than a meat and dairy-laden diet. Mm -hmm. But um, I don't know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm not hearing that, you that the administration has necessarily contemplated um, Mm -hmm. the possibility of those costs being higher. Yeah. I mean, one of the fundamental problems with all of our city contracts um, that the mayor inherited from the prior administrations was no increase in, f to allow for increased in cost of food, rent, et cetera, and certainly people. Yeah. Um, and he's made some accommodations for that, but I don't know that you know, my senior centers, the senior centers in my district could afford sure. to pay for fresh food versus canned and processed. Sure. Again, really appreciate the intent of the question. And as soon as we have some data to actually discuss, I look forward to doing that with you as well. Okay. I mean, I, uh, I really want to emphasize that to me, 
your budget is a reflection of your policy. And I don't think there's extra money. I know there's not additional money in the budget for fresh food. And so by definition, it means um, that the senior centers, the food pantries, have to get money outside of the government system or else feed fewer people. I will also uh, share that the local economies and the, the foods um, coming direct from the state and the region is one element of, of five values. So it could be, you know, um, you know, until we have data, we aren't uh, in a position to sort of make the priorities around um, it could be workforce, it could be more health and nutrition, it could be more local food as well, but making some of the uh, commitments across those values, not just I exclusively in the local food area, is, is what we're looking to do across all five values. Well, right. Now, if we're going to expand to all the values, then cost is really going to go up, right? Because we want to hire people who are going to stay where there are career ladders, where we're having educated people who are talking about wellness. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just talking about fresh yeah. food. I'm, I mean, uh, but you're right. I mean, the bigger picture is yeah. a big deal. Um, we are in close conversations with uh, cities who have also been implementing this from Boston to Chicago to Los Angeles to really um, be thought partners in thinking through their implementation and learn from the lessons um, in uh, making contract changes. These are really important questions to ask. And so what's happening in Boston or these other localities as they switch over to fresh food, are they allocating more funds in their budget for that? Mm -hmm. um, so this is my less than four months on the job. Um, we are making progress to uh, have I've had conversations with each of those cities. Um, they are the first of what will be many. Thank you. And then lastly, um, specifically, the council member raised um, that through HRA, I think, EFAP, yeah. we pay for EFAP. And I'm wondering uh, whether or not the administration has made the change yet to allow product fle flexibility under EFAP. I think right now there's a list of about 30 processed products to choose from. Yeah. for our nonprofits, and um, none of those are fresh or regional products. So um, EFAP is, is our basic um, program that we're funding that's so desperately needed now, and there's no accommodation for even the opportunity yeah. for a fresh product. When do you expect the administration to change those rules? Or does that require uh, a law change in some way? Yep, thank you. Actually, I think it was the second week of my um, role. I, was, I met with Grace and her team at HRA. Yeah. Um, and they are, I've been heavily involved in the RFP creation for uh, new EFAP vendors. Um, and that, I believe, is set to hit, you know, within the next month. Um, and uh, we are looking to certainly expand from those original 14 food items that were contracted um, for the last, you know, at least three, if not longer years. Um, so I you're waiting for the RFP to come out. We're waiting. The public is waiting to see the RFP. Um, I believe it is still being, um, uh, Mox is reviewing it. It will be public um, to get new uh, bids in for an expanded variety of food that EFAP uh, vendors will be procuring. And so, again, the two-part question. Um, are you saying, I, I really think it's important just to nail this down, this is our opportunity in the public, will, will that new RFP, you're saying, will include an option for fresh food purchasing? Um, I have not seen it since November, but my understanding is that it will include fresh food. And does Mox happen to have an answer? I have not looked at the RFP specifically. We're happy to follow up with you, with uh, the uh, D DHS. The, uh, HRA. The HRA, sorry. DSS. Okay, you can imagine, I I'm not going to get frustrated, but you can imagine that's frustrating to hear. It seems pretty basic given 
the principles that you laid out, not to be able to just answer yes or no whether or not the RFP includes it. I don't, I don't mean to be a jerk, but. We'll get back to you as soon as we can confirm the information. Is one of the things holding it back the possibility of it costing more money? No, I believe that there was a question. In fact, I had a conversation with, um, with Borough President Brewer about this, um, whether or not the city charter included specifically those 14 food items or not. And I did double check that, and I believe there's no mention of the specific 14 foods in the city charter. So to answer your question about can the scope of food that EFAP um, has historically been sourcing change, my understanding of that is yes, it can. So again, my um, interest is making sure government works and making sure that our budget aligns with what we say we're doing. And it strikes me, and the things I'll be looking for when the RFP comes out, is whether or not there's an opportunity for fresh food purchasing and whether or not there's an increase in reimbursement when nonprofits choose to purchase fresh food, right? Because again, if there's no increase in funding, there's no incentive besides wanting to do the right thing and requiring now the nonprofits to ask for private funding or somehow get the resources if they want to serve the same number of people. You know, how do we meet? their desire to provide fresh food. One step is allowing them to do it, and the second is giving them the money to do it. So is that fair that I could be looking for those two things in the RFP? Because I imagine it would address both of those issues. I think that's absolutely fair. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you. I. Uh, had a quick question about ACS, and I'm not sure if you have the info, but uh, if you were able to break out the DCAS spending with ACS, that would be helpful. Do you, do you have that by any chance? Meaning what uh, ACS procures through DCAS contracts versus other contracts? Yes, please. Yeah, no, we don't have that at this time, but we can Thank follow Thank you, we'll follow yep. up. Uh, spoilers, spoilers. Um, yeah, somebody will be testifying very shortly. Uh, is it true? that uh, DCAS, that every apple and onion you purchase from the state of New York, we, we, this is a spoiler from the t testimony we'll be getting for our borough president, is it true that all the apples and onions are from New York State? 100% of our apples, uh, our onions, uh, depends on the contract, but some years, yes, 100% as well. Great, and then uh, are you, is DCAS limited by the 10%? Uh, price difference, or are you sometimes able to exceed it? So we're we're mostly sticking to the 10 percent, but we ha have been having recent conversations about whether or not there's opportunity to go above that using other methods. Okay, and then I had a question about local law 2015. Sorry, local law 215 of 2017. Uh, New York City schools. Uh, I, I'm looking at the. Uh, menu for this coming Thursday, and uh, give me one moment. I, so I'm looking at the uh, breakfast menu for this coming Thursday, January 16th, and we're going to have New York Bagel Thursday, uh, sorted fresh New York bagel sticks and bagel served with cream cheese and jelly, uh, fresh New York apples, and uh, there's a yogurt parfait on the Thursday menu. Uh, however, on, uh, I believe, uh, Tuesday, January 21st, we're going to have Upstate Farms uh, yogurt choice. And uh, I, I ended up Googling Upstate Farms, and it's apparently a cooperative of some 200 uh, dairies uh, in Upstate New York. And so uh, I want to appreciate that uh, the DOE has been very responsive on the Local Law 215 report of 2017. It's actually been getting better. So. Um, on the report, it'll say yogurt. You'll have the different flavors. Is it possible to add yet another item in the field to include whether or not it is a locally sourced product, or even when it is something where you can actually just say literally New York apples? 
Hi, my name is Moshe Becker. I'm Chief of Staff at the Office of Food and Hold Nutrition. Hold on one second. Uh, and can you share your favorite New York food? Yes, I'm an Apple, uh, an Apple uh, fan. Me, New me York too. State Apples. We will ask you to affirm, please. Okay, please raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in yes, your testimony I do. today? Great, thank you. Please continue. Yes, um, so my name is Moshe Becker, Chief of Staff at the Office of Food and Nutrition Services for New York City Department of Education. Um, roughly half of the yogurt that, we, that DOE purchases for its breakfast, lunch, and after school programs comes from New York State or is confirmed to be coming from New York State farms. Um, and so it is featured on multiple days. It is not exclusively served on New York Thursdays. Uh, but the, the New York Thursdays yogurt isn't necessarily a, so, so the New York Thursdays yogurt is a New York yogurt? Yes, the New York State, the New York Thursday yogurt is New York State yogurt. And the cream cheese and the jelly too? I would have to check to confirm that. We, we better be good if uh, Thursday is uh, New York Thursday. I take great pride in that. And then are you able to update the report to include uh, whether or not the food is local? So we're, we're happy to work with council to make tweaks to the report as the years go on um, to get the council information that it, it's looking to see. Um, we are in the process ourselves of updating our own data gathering mechanisms and processes, and um, we would hope that an upcoming report would be able to share origin information as well. I, I, you've been very responsive, and I think we can just get this done without, I, I reports, legislation is the worst thing we can do. We, can, we should be just doing a lot of the things that the Mayor's Office of Food and everyone is just doing to get it done. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to excuse you briefly. Uh, I'd like to bring up the Borough President. I'd like to reserve just in case any questions arise out of the Borough President's testimony. Uh, so we are now going to ask uh, the author of Local Law 50 of 2011, who actually sent a letter to our uh, to, to us requesting this hearing, uh, Manhattan Borough President uh, Gail Brewer, uh, to testify. And uh, before you begin, just as everyone else who has appeared before the committee, you do not need to be sworn in, but you do have to tell me what is your favorite New York food? Two, potatoes and chocolate milk. <laughs> Thank you. That's better than your question earlier. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. You can't believe what he asked me earlier. Should I raise my right hand? You're good. Okay. Uh, Shula Warren, please join me from policy director in our office. So I am Gail Brewer. I am the Manhattan Borough President, and I want to thank Chair Kalos and the other members of the committee who are here for this opportunity. And I just want to make it really clear that I am here to support more New York State food purchasing by city agencies as promoted by Local Law 50 and others, and I want to thank you for having this. It's a very complicated issue, um, as you know, because we're trying to accomplish so many different goals. We're trying to have fresh, healthy food. We're trying to have local food. We're trying to have scratch food. Um, we're trying to save the family farms, which is another aspect. Uh, we're trying to keep it at an, a, a cost that is appropriate, and we're obviously dealing with contracts. We're also dealing with transportation. It's very hard to bring this food in from the farm. So as you know, um, in 2011 and 14 and 15 and 18, my office sponsored several upstate farm tours for agencies and nonprofits. And we want to thank Cornell University's Cooperative Extension and Grow NYC for helping us. And then most recently, last October, I really want to thank the Department of Environmental Protection. We went to the Catskill Watershed Farm to Chef Forum with the Natural Resources Defense Council and the Watershed Agriculture Council and the Fulton Market Association at Pace University. And what you learn there is these farms in the Catskills uh, are A, working with DEC to try to make sure, DEP, I'm sorry, to try to make sure that the farms are not a detriment to the water shed and the city is paying them to try to do the right kind of watershed protection. So it's another place where we need to purchase to keep these farms going because they're doing the right thing. Um, this whole uh, 
relationship between upstate and downstate is very, very important to our health because they are the ticket to fresh fruits and vegetables. And we should be proud of our watershed because um, it's where a lot of the farms are and where we're growing and where we're making a difference in terms of uh, bringing in good product. We've also learned that in order to really see an impact with our considerable contracting funds, we've got a three-pronged approach. One, as you've heard earlier, we need better data collection and tracking on what agencies and nonprofits are buying and how it's being prepared. Is it scratch? Is it prepared? Number two, agencies and vendors need information on what and how New York State products can be integrated into their meal programs, as you've heard earlier. And three, this administration needs to clearly prioritize New York State purchasing to city agencies and vendors. The, the governor is not perfect, the mayor is not perfect, but the governor has said to Commissioner Ball on the state level, purchase locally, and we need to hear that from our mayor. During one of my farm tours, a conversation between staff from the New York State Ag and Markets and Green Market, also called Grow NYC, we saw that the New York State Corrections Facilities onion contract was being filled with a California State onion even though New York has a great onion. And the contract was amended, and the state farms are able to compete and fill the bid. We need a similar approach. We heard earlier that most of the onions uh, coming into city agencies are from our local farms, but it really should be 100%. <coughs> in 2011, the council passed a package of bills, as you mentioned earlier, to expand local food purchasing, 50 and 52. Local Law 50 encourages, I couldn't mandate, city agencies and vendors to purchase food grown or produced in New York State by establi establishing <coughs> oh, sorry, tools of procurement, including a price preference within 10% of the lowest responsible bidder, and mandate that particular products come from New York State and best value provisions that ensure freshness by limiting the time between harvest and delivery. As was pointed out to me by the farmers, if the truck from California, bumpity, 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 bump with the lettuce, takes two weeks. If it comes only from Putnam, Ulster, Seneca, it's gonna be here in two days and have that shelf life of two weeks. Gotta do local. So we certainly wanna thank DCAS, Education, DOE, and nonprofits like Lenox Hill Neighborhood House for their attention to buying New York State products. But more can be done. And I think you know that Local Law 50 requires the city's chief procurement officer to provide an annual report of the efforts during the preceding fiscal year to implement the city guidelines for the purchase of state food. The goal is to gather and make data available to better understand the city's purchase practices. According to the fiscal 2017 local law 50 report, this is in 2017, only 59 vendors from across the five boroughs were sent surveys, thank you, of which only 11 responded. And then in 2018 FY, 66 vendors were sent surveys, but only three responded. And as it noted in FY 2019, in that report, 97 vendors were sent surveys and nine responded. It's a limited pool of vendors surveyed. There's also an abysmal response rate. So there's a huge information gap. And therefore, there's an incomplete understanding of the successes, the opportunities, and the challenges in getting local products into our city agencies and the people who utilize them. There are other challenges, you know, some vendors are not being required to respond to the survey. I want to thank Mox currently and the other agencies because they are integrating the survey questions into Passport, which I call Vendex, but I understand is the new Vendex, you know better than I. I'm still old Vendex, whatever. Making it part of the standardized contracting process. Beyond the current requested sourcing data, it would also be invaluable to have a deeper understanding of how each agency or nonprofit vendor prepares and serves meals, the 
equipment used, the staff hours spent per meal and portion on a daily and weekly basis, and the needs for raw as well as partially and super processed foods. Agencies that have the infrastructure to prepare scratch cooked meals have different needs than agencies that require specifications like identical chicken portions for the Department of Correction. And I thought this was a great comment made from DCAS when I met with them because if you do not have every single piece of chicken to be the exact same size, then you're gonna have fights and I understand that amongst individuals at Rikers. Also, uh, the good news is the Kitchen at Rikers is a culinary training program. So what do you need specifically for that? There is a real need for each agency, particularly the ones that I focused on, the DCAS buys for, they have very specific needs. The other need is the processing and the jobs that go with it and the facilities. That's another whole topic, but some people feel the processing should be done privately, not by the government. Everything from the cutting of the apples to the processing of the lettuce washing and the list goes on. Who should be doing that so that the city agencies can purchase locally? I don't know the answer, but I know that we need to answer it. The report response rate also begs the question if nonprofit vendors have enough information to identify their locally sourced items. This is a huge problem. Uh, the green market, Grow NYC, can easily demonstrate where their products come from. But is this information as readily available from some of the largest companies from which so many vendors order? I just want to make a point here, which is that if the city purchases, then more farms further upstate would be able to survive. Because right now, the green market can come from a place from where one can drive early in the morning. I'm from Geneva, New York, my cousin. They're not gonna come all the way down. Don't ask me any more questions about Geneva, New York, Mr. Kalos. <laughs> so the issues are we need to have city agencies purchase for another reason, which is more family farms can survive. Um, city agencies should develop resources to help vendors identify New York State products. For instance, New York State dairy farms produce quality, standardized, consistent items, as you can imagine, butter, yogurt, milk, cottage cheese. Um, it's a helpful resource, would include a list of these items produced by the state, identified by company name, and the product sizes that are commonly ordered. To be, in summary, the city has to tell vendors what is available in New York State, and the agencies need to identify it for the vendors. It's just what has to get done. From early childhood and homeless programs to schools and senior centers, we are spending, as you heard earlier from Council Member Rosenthal, millions of dollars on food purchases, but not enough is being invested in our local farms and communities. Our state is a leading producer of products such as dairy, beef, apples, cabbage, onions, squash, and potatoes. That's where our money should be spent. So last October, to the credit of DCAS, in the mezzanine of one center street was the second annual Department of Citywide Administrative Services Food Expo. There were uh, wonderful uh, vendors all around the room, and the purpose was to engage food vendors, prospective food vendors, agencies that purchase food, nonprofit vendors, and city agencies that play a rule, role, any role, in food purchasing. And it was exciting, that's when we learned then, as you did today, that the apples and onions are from New York State. That was exciting. And the market, we learned, of additional New York State items to be mandated for procurement beyond the 10% price difference. And you got a little bit of an answer there. Um, I think we need to pursue that further. But possibility is, if it's local, maybe we can go even further on that price difference to be discussed. We met people at the expo uh, from the uh, terrific apples. It's Lynn Oaken Farms in Medina, New York. That's where we purchase our fresh food for seniors 
local fruit and vegetable. That's why we get our apples as an example. I tasted their yogurts. I tasted their baked goods at the mezzanine. The sweet potato pie from G&K Sweet Food, which is an MWBE bakery. I wasn't too happy about the potatoes. I don't know if they were real or not. They didn't taste real to me. So that's an example. Maybe they were real. They didn't taste real. They were flaky. According to New York State Ag and Markets, potatoes, as I thought, because I love them, are one of the top 10 agriculture products, and they're available all year round. They don't need refrigeration. Why are not agencies and vendors record requesting real potatoes and not just add water potatoes? These are issues that I think we should be able to answer. In terms of the seniors, in uh, uh, the Commissioner Lorraine Cortez Vasquez of DIFTA, she is redesigning the home delivered meal and senior center nutrition program. And here's an example of an opportunity to increase older adult access to fresh locally sourced and sustainable foods. Just this past May to try to make sure this happens, my office, Shula Warren in particular, convened a meeting of Manhattan Senior Center Food Services staff with DIFTA, Grow NYC, and the amazing as you know, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House to discuss the various possibilities and challenges to integrating local produce into their congregate meal programs. Despite us working with DIFTA and Grow NYC over six years ago to ensure that senior centers could swap local seasonally available produce into their pre-submitted menus, senior center food staff said that they are still encountering difficult difficulties implementing healthier menu changes, and they're having difficulty in obtaining produce swapping approval from DIFTA, from the nutritional staff in particular. There are other barriers, like insufficient funding, as you heard earlier, for kitchen equipment and food service workers. They should all be part of the RFP consultation with people like the staff at Lenox Hill, whose teaching kitchen has significantly transformed food programs at over 100 participating nonprofits to include more fresh, healthy, and local food, only because the wonderful Lenox Hill and Council Member Kalos' district has done that. I want to also uh, echo what we heard earlier about EFAP. Um, I'm glad that the RFP might be changed to offer more choice and fresh options, but I didn't hear from the earlier testimony that it is going to happen. The other issue, there are so many of them, is this transportation problem. The farmers have to get the items to New York. Obviously, when they come from Green Market, it's a particular location and a particular time. Until Grow NYC's food hub at Hans Point is completed, perhaps in the next two years, this is still a challenge because they're not comfortable going into Hunts Point. It's too big for them to be able to navigate. Finally, Local Law 50 is only as helpful as the administration's directive, as I mentioned earlier, to agencies and vendors that buying from New York State Farms is a New York City priority. And I want to say to her credit and the administration's, Kate McKenzie, as you heard testifying earlier, it's a, amazingly new, ma amazing and new head of the Mayor's Office of Food Policy. She is partnering with city agencies on implementing the good food purchasing program standards, starting with a baseline assessment. This information, although expensive, as you heard earlier, will provide a valuable tool in shaping the path forward, but more is needed on product mandates, educational, regional planning, contract scrutiny, and investment across all agencies to expand New Yorkers' access to the healthy, fresh, and locally sourced foods that also deliver environmental and economic benefits, as I indicated about the Catskills watershed, for those of us living upstate and downstate. Thank you very much. This is a complicated issue. I appreciate you tackling it. It can only work for the benefit of all of us if we're successful. Thank you very much. Thank you for all the great work that uh, you and your policy director have been doing on this uh, for going back before 2011. Uh, in your 
in your work, have you had opportunity to see the surveys that are circulated as a result of Local Law 50? And is there any opportunity to improve those surveys uh, for those that receive them? Or would you prefer to focus on the technological approach moving forward? I think forward? there's definitely room. Shula's going to have to answer that. Sure. You have to put your thing on. I mean, there are not many of them being responded to. That's part of the problem. Go ahead, Sewell. Yeah. Wait, wait, push the hold, hold on. We need your name, title, and favorite New York food. Sure. My name is Shulamit Warren Pluter. I'm the director of policy for <clears throat> Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer. Apples all day. Um, <laughs> so I was adding to Gail, and I think also to adding to what um, both Mox and, and DCAS and also um, Kate spoke to as well is that I think, you know, really looking through that list of questions. Um, folding also the responses into kind of more regular responses that city agencies that are already getting, you know, have to go through a lot of contracting questions already. Having them also respond to local sourcing questions as part of that process will get a better response too. But also probably giving those, you know, asking vendors, some may definitely know where their items are coming from in terms of New York State, especially if they're getting it from Green Market Co. But they also may need more information too and more tools on how to actually identify where their items are coming from and what items they could be purchasing too from New York State. So there's a lot of um, area for improvement, but also looks like the agencies are also focused on that as well. I, I think you said it a number of times, but can local law 50, if followed and uh, with their suggestions of, of surveying people multiple times throughout the process, can that drive home or even force uh, a, the, a top down or even the mayor to come out and, and say he wants to do a local food preference? I mean, I think it can. One of the issues that I hear from agencies is that, uh, uh, Gail, if we focus on fresh fruits and vegetables and they're not available because we have to plan well in advance what happens, and my answer from the farmers, Cornell, Grow NYC is okay, then also order from California or wherever you need to. So you should be able to do both. You need to have the flexibility as well as the local sourcing. So I do think that top-down is where we have to go in this particular case, as has been done on the state, but we have to understand there has to be flexibility. Our, uh, one element that I'm not sure was touched upon at all is, is there a difference in terms of carbon impact if we're getting a bushel of apples from... New York versus a bushel of apples from California, or in mm -hmm. your case, you actually were able to get us to use New York onions instead of California onions. So I guess, is there a different carbon impact between yeah. the two? Oh, I think so, because obviously you're bringing, I assume most of the product from California comes from truck. Uh, you're gonna have a two hour drive or three hour drive versus many, many hours from California. Yes, the answer to your question is yes. I, I think that is all of my questions. Is there any question that I should have asked that I missed? No, you did a great job. This is a hard challenge to be able to be successful, and I'm really appreciative that you're trying because of all the issues that I mentioned when I started. It's uh, hard to get our hands around um, scratch cooking, locally sourced, transportation, contracting, cost, and I think you're on the way to doing that, and I'm deeply appreciative. Uh, our pleasure. Thank uh, you. So uh, we will send a lot of the questions that you had along with our questions uh, and a joint follow-up letter to the administration. We'd like to get that response back to the Contracts Committee and uh, the Manhattan Borough President's Office. You can send that response. Uh, Mercita already knows this email. It's contracts at bencalos.com. Uh, it's how we got the Eager Beaver Award in City and State. Uh, so we'll excuse this panel. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. We have uh, two panels of experts coming up. Uh, we will excuse uh, a handful of folks, but we would hope to keep at least one or two folks from the administration. Uh, our first panel uh, will include Charles Plackin from the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, uh, Mark from the Natural Resources Defense Council, uh, David French from uh, Lenox Hill Neighborhood House, uh, who got the gold star today. Uh, it's hard to get that gold star from the borough president, so I'm impressed. And Lauren Phillips from Food Bank for New York City.
So th this panel is particularly hard because I work so close with many of you. Uh, typically we do a five minute clock for testimony, but uh, we can also waive the clock. It is your call as well as for those on the second panel. What would you like to do? No clock or five minute clock? It's either five minutes or none. Okay, uh, we will do a uh, five minute clock. Uh, and uh, it is hard to choose favorites, so I'll let you decide amongst yourselves. <laughs> and, and do please to make sure to share your, your name, your title, uh, for the record, of course, as well as your favorite New York food. Charles Platkin, I'm the executive director of the New York City, uh, Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, and broccoli is my favorite. Oh, yes, Gail, broccoli. <laughs> Good afternoon, and thank you, Chairperson Kalos and the members of the Committee on Contracts for the opportunity to submit oral and written testimony regarding local food procurement in New York City. I'd also like to thank Gail Brewer, the Manhattan Borough President, for all of her work in food policy in general. My name is Charles Platkin, and I'm providing this testimony on behalf of the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, of which I'm the executive director. The center works with policymakers, community organizations, advocates, and the public to create healthier, more sustainable food environments. We thank the City Council for their continued support. The center applauds the members of the City Council for the continued efforts to improve local food procurement. Local Law 50 and 52 strive to support New York State farmers while increasing and facilitating access to local food for New York City residents. Additionally, these laws create awareness of the importance of local food procurement. It should be noted that oftentimes advancing food policy and healthy eating behaviors begins with just creating the awareness. Given that New York City agencies purchase millions of dollars of food each year and serve more than 260 million meals, the benefits of purchasing and consuming local food are far reaching. Here are just some of them. Local food systems support local farmers, contribute to local and regional economies, reduce transportation costs and greenhouse gases, cut down on the paper and plastic packaging, keep farming land and agricultural use, use fewer pesticides, promote a safer food supply by reducing the chances of contamination, provide less processed and more nutritious food, and create an increased likelihood that individuals will make healthier choices which reduce the risk of diet-related diseases such as diabetes. The center recognizes the efforts currently underway and is eager to support the city council in seeking additional ways to expand and improve local food procurement, specifically with regard to Local Law 50 and 52. With this in mind, here are seven recommendations, and I can expand on them afterwards if necessary. Number one, expand Local Law 52 to require that all city agencies provide information on local food procurement for the inclusion in the annual food metrics report. Number two, mandate food suppliers, uh, these are with whom the city agencies and the vendors buy their food from, to provide sourcing information. Number three, create a quote unquote supply local awareness campaign for these food suppliers. Uh, number four, incentivize food service contractors, which is what I'm calling vendors, to provide local food procurement data. Number five, implement a monetary penalty in the form of a budget reduction, for example, for city agencies and food service providers that fail to report local food procurement. Number six, increase the price preference percentage of New York State food under Local Law 50. This is the 10% that we were talking about. Um, we just don't know whether it's 10%, 15%, or 20%, as one of the council members had pointed out, and, and uh, Manhattan Borough President Brewer. Number seven, streamline the reporting process, which we have discussed, by creating a web form to make it simple and straightforward for food service contractors and city agencies to report local food procurement. And this could be a web form like a form stack or survey monkey or something created by the city, or it could be something where we, it's automatically read from purchases that are made by city agencies and their vendors. We at the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center recognize the importance of expanding local procurement, and we stand ready, and help, ready to help in any way we can. Thank you again for the opportunity to provide oral and written testimony. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Mark Eisman. I'm a senior attorney and the New York Regional Director of the Natural Resources Defense Council, NRDC. Uh, as you know, uh, NRDC is a national environmental group that has also been long active on New York City issues, including on regional food and nutrition. Uh, we commend Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer and the Council uh, for holding this hearing. Um, we know that as has been discussed, that food is important from an environmental, public health, and equity standpoint. It's also very important for the planet. As much as 25% or more of climate change pollution comes from the food and ag sector. Uh, and in fact, an international scientific study came out in 2019, said, quote, food is the single strongest lever to optimize human health and environmental sustainability on Earth. Uh, that's quite a statement. Uh, so why are we talking about procurement? Well, there's a, as uh, nerdy as procurement sounds, uh, it's had a long history for advancing health and sustainability in New York City. And we've been involved in many of those efforts. In the 1980s, this council passed legislation requiring the purchasing of recycled paper, which led to less trees being cut down and less pollution. In the mid-1990s, this council also passed a set of procurement bills focusing on energy efficiency, greener cleaning products, uh, and other goods using less plastic. And in 2011, as we all know, uh, with the health, the environment, and the local economy in mind, we passed uh, uh, Local Law 50 and 52. Uh, former uh, US Supreme Court Justice William Brennan once said that ultimately enforcement of the law is what really counts. And uh, we've heard many good things about what New York City's trying to do and has advanced, uh, including uh, through under this law and the nutritional standards that were done in 2008, um, the Department of Education's leadership on, on school food, particularly the Urban School Food Alliance in New York Thursdays. But the bottom line is that the dictates and the promise of local uh, laws passed in 2011 have not been uh, fulfilled. So we have three recommendations. The first is that the city should build on the good reporting requirements of Local Law 50 and 52 to pass new legislation that would A, establish concrete purchasing targets. This is something that the Manhattan Borough President wanted to do the first time, uh, but it's time to do that now. And second, to tie those targets uh, to healthy, sustainable, and equitably produced food standards. Um, we, we, were test we testified a few months ago in, in front of the, the, the council about the Good Food Purchasing Program. We heard about that earlier today, and that's a great framework for, for moving forward. Uh, second, um, it's important that the council should focus any new procurement commitments uh, on harnessing the power of food to reinvest and build wealth in low-income communities and communities of color. Uh, so many of the health public challenges we face today are the result of longstanding structural racism and disinvestment in communities of color. So uh, whether as farmers, small business owners, city contractors, the city should prioritize contracts with disadvantaged New Yorkers and help chart a path to a greater wealth and keep more money in the communities through the procurement. And third, the city council should consider creating a New York City food purchasing czar, someone who can focus all of their time on connecting agency purchasing officers with regional farmers and distribution hubs. Our experience from talking to regional food experts, many of which are in the room today, over the last decade is that having such a person be, you know, serving as a matchmaker uh, is invaluable if New York City really wants to ramp up its purchasing of local sustainable sourcing. That's a missing link, uh, and it was something that we talked about with the Manhattan Borough Presidents at a recent conference, uh, upstate, downstate, New York City, watershed, food shed conference. So uh, we thank the, the council and the borough president's office again for their leadership and commitment on all these issues and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair Kalos, council members. My name is David French. I'm the director of philanthropy and healthy food initiatives at Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. We strongly support local food procurement for city-funded meals and uh, support the remarks of Manhattan Borough President Gail Brewer, 
We are here today to share our experience serving, f serving 400,000 meals annually, as well as our experience training 117 nonprofit programs, serving 10 million meals across all five boroughs, how to serve more fresh, healthy, and local food. Two takeaways I would like to share from that experience are that it is entirely possible to serve locally procured food and to do it without raising costs. We source more than 30% of our food locally, including more than 50% of our produce, and are Grow Green Market Co.'s largest institutional customer. We operate a program that focuses on serving more plant-based food. Currently, we serve 66% vegetarian meals and more scratch cooking. As a trainer, I can tell you that providers want to serve more local food but face many barriers, particularly because local food typically means fresh food, and most institutional food kitchens are set up to serve frozen food. Changing that will require broader access to local vendors and investment in training, equipment, and infrastructure. The biggest barrier now is that most providers think they can't afford to serve more local food. Lenox Hills Teaching Kitchen shows providers how they can shop seasonally for competitive prices using local fruits and vegetables in season, storage crops like apples, onions, squash and carrots, and whole grains like oats, farro, and barley, and local flour. We also show organizations that you can actually make meals healthier by cutting costs, by eliminating juice, which is expensive and full of sugar, by reducing processed food because fresh Fresh food is cheaper and healthier than processed, and most importantly, by serving less meat. Meat is the most expensive item in most public plate meals. By serving more plant-based food, providers can save money, support their clients' health, and reduce environmental impact. In conclusion, we strongly support City Council to encourage local sourcing for public plate meals, and including the support of a mandated local uh, of mandated local food sourcing for city-funded meals. These steps would benefit public health, strengthen local farms and the local economy, protect New York's watershed, and increase our environmental sustainability and resiliency. Thank you for your consideration of this testimony and for your in efforts to increase local food procurement. <clears throat> Uh, good afternoon, Chair Kalos and members of the Contracts Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony today regarding local food procurement. My name is Lauren Phillips, and I am the Government Relations Manager for the Food Bank for New York City. Food Bank for New York City serves 58 million free meals to roughly 1.6 million food insecure New Yorkers each year. Food Bank relies on the generous support and partnerships with the city, state, and federal government to make this service possible. As a recipient of donated food and a critical food distribution partner to New York City, the Emergency Food Network serves, uh, sorry, the Emergency Food Network works to serve community need in the face of limited resources and available capacity. We are proud to work closely with DYCD and HRA to help provide meals across the city. Our partnership with DYCD provides resources to more than 200 food pantries supported by members of the New York City Council through the Food Pantries Initiative. Thanks to the vocal support and leadership of this council, DYCD is also our chief partner in supporting 25 pantries on campuses at public K-12 schools across the five boroughs. Our partnership with HRA makes it possible for Food Bank to distribute shelf-stable and frozen food items through EFAP, which is a cornerstone of supply for more than 500 emergency food programs across New York. We are grateful for these relationships and the ongoing support for these initiatives from the members of the council. For low-income New Yorkers, the need for food resource is persistent. For many, the federal SNAP program is the most flexible and efficient resource for food assistance as it provides a benefit that can be used at grocery stores across the city. However, recent federal policy changes to SNAP threaten to cut or strip away this assistance, in turn threatening the food security of more of our neighbors. When SNAP is insufficient or unavailable, households turn to the emergency food network. Food Bank's most recent survey of our network shows that with the current supply, 60% of our member food pantries and soup kitchens report running out of food at least once per month. 36% of our network report that they are forced to ration food, and nearly 75% of members report needing more fresh produce, meat, poultry, and fish in order to serve those on their lines. Emergency food providers are running out of the types of food that their clients need most. These items, including perishable foods like produce and protein, are also often the most expensive for households to purchase with available resources. 
Many food pantries utilize client choice food distribution model that both maximizes resource efficiency and provides dignity for community members who are able to choose items most appropriate for themselves and their family. Expanding choice in EFAP allows for more culturally competent food distribution and accommodates nutritional needs and individual preferences of families that visit food pantries. For emergency food providers and for Food Bank for New York City, expanding choice also requires flexibility for procurement and investment of resources and technology to facilitate safe storage, transportation, and distribution. We are grateful for the opportunity to collaborate with the city in our efforts to end hunger. We encourage the city to continue to invest in emergency food partners to support choice for healthful, culturally re relevant, and tasty food items. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify today. Uh, first question to uh, Charles Plack, and on page two of your testimony, I'm not sure you got a chance to get to it, but you gave a uh, rather disturbing statistic relating to how far our food travels from farm to plate. Uh, if you could share that with us, and this is why I like having academics at our hearings, they give us. In the United facts. States, <clears throat> fresh produce travels an average of 1,500 miles from farm to plate. Uh, about the equivalent of driving uh, from New York to Dallas, Texas. Purchasing locally grown food means the food travels shorter distances, which we've already discussed, and thereby de decreasing fossil fuel consumptions, greenhouse gas emissions, and air pollution. Uh, if you can do the final piece, because that shares a little bit more of the picture. Sure. Typical food distribution in the United States results in 5 to 17 times more uh, carbon emissions than locally purchased food. Thank you, and I, I will also note that it appears that uh, this was a, from a peer-reviewed journal, uh, your yeah. statistics, so this is, this is peer-reviewed. This is not, uh, that, that, is the, that is the gold standard, as it were. Yeah, I mean, all the citations in here are, from, are mostly from journals. I appreciate it. Uh, and then, uh, Mr. Plackin, you, you, you have a Juris Doctor, is that correct? Yes. Okay, and uh, Mark Eisman, you also are an attorney. That's correct. I have to admit that. So I have a response uh, to both of your recommendations, which is yes. Uh, the limitations that we have, as we made in the opening statement, are the general municipal law and the state finance law. So uh, I will ask you, and uh, you're not under oath, but uh, everyone's watching. Uh, would you be willing to collaborate with uh, the uh, with uh, with our office as a chair of contracts with uh, the borough president on uh, pushing the limits of the uh, state law and uh, doing as much as we possibly can related to your uh, recommendations. Yes. Yes, absolutely. And, and, and as I said in the testimony, actually, uh, NRDC and we've been involved since the late 80s, actually, on working with the city council on procurement law. And so we're very familiar with the constraints and what can be done and not be done. And so we stand ready to work with this committee and the council to develop those new standards. So we'll take a, a first look at the recommendations that you've now provided along with the borough president's office, our uh, committee council and uh, the borough president's council along with their policy director will give you some feedback and questions and will you commit to coming back with whatever legal memorandum or research we need in order to move forward. Yes. I, I just have one question, it's a little tangential. Does, has anybody received the information on local, uh, local purchasing from, from the actual city agencies, not the vendors of the city agencies? Because they serve, other than Department of Education, has there been any, um, is that information available? It's uh, a, I think beyond the food metrics report, I don't think so, but we do have members of the administration and we will include that uh, voluntary request. Uh, and, and I think- From the 11 city agencies other than the Department of Education, their specific D purchasing. DOE is already covered. We yeah, no, except the DOE, yes, we know that. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we can put those additional information requests and then uh, the other item that I actually find kind of interesting is those of you on that side of the table, particularly from academic institutions, can sign, MO, can sign MOUs and get access to information that sometimes we can't uh, to do uh, academic studies. So that, that is helpful. Uh, 
And I, I, I would note that um, I am second on the good purchase, food purchasing legislation in TRO 1660, and I want to compliment Councilmember Andy Cohen and his legislative director, uh, Patty, uh, for beating me on that one uh, and getting that in first. But uh, I promise you I am a close second and looking forward to uh, getting that done. Uh, I had a question for Lenox Hill Neighborhood House. Um, and full disclosure, I have been there. I have had their food. Uh, so I, I guess uh, first question is, so I'm looking at the menu that you attached. Yes, from our Innovative Senior Center. And so for, for next week's menu, I am seeing coconut curried cod <laughs> for lunch, uh, as well as potato and spinach frittata. I see a dinner, a baked salmon with cilantro and citrus sauce. And for breakfast, they, uh, this is one of my favorite meals, shakshuka, which you actually explain what it is, which is baked eggs with onions and peppers. Often it includes a tomato base, which is omitted, but I'll <laughs> forgive you for that. Um, the, tell me, so first, if somebody's watching at home right now and they just, their mouths just started watering, uh, what, what, where do you serve? Where do folks usually have to live or are there any requirements? change requirements and uh, are these meals free or is there a voluntary contribution or, or how does that work? My understanding is New York City senior centers are open to any adults uh, age 60 plus from all five boroughs. There is a voluntary suggested donation for meals and uh, we have open arms for all in both of our seniors, both the uh, center at 70th and 1st and Saint, the Senior Center at St. Peter's Church on 54th Street, which serves the same lunch menu. And the, what is the voluntary contribution for a senior, and what is the voluntary contribution for a member of the public? I don't have that information. I believe it is $1.25 for seniors and $2.50 for general members of the public, <laughs> because I have paid it, and boy, did I get my money's worth. Uh, <laughs> in your testimony, you indicate, and I quote, fresh food is cheaper, cheaper, uh, and healthier than processed food, that seems counterintuitive. Did you, would you care to elaborate? I feel like most people would say, well, it's much cheaper to buy a vat of, uh, of, uh, of uh, pe peanut, uh, uh, peanut butter from what, what, processed peanut butter with mostly chemicals and corn syrup, uh, or uh, I, I'm, I'm having trouble grasping at processed foods because I, I don't have them in my home, but. I'd say some of, some of the uh, examples that we share most often are we make our own granola using New York State oats uh, that is less, lower in sugar, tastier and healthier than Cheerios or another box cereal. We also encourage so our your ancient grain hot cereal <laughs> that you'll be serving on the 21st and the coconut cranberry granola, that's all locally made? That's all lo using local products wow. and cheaper than any equivalent that we could buy from a, a mainline vendor. And the other example would be salad dressings or sauces that we encourage. Uh, our participants in the teaching kitchen to make. They can make their own salad dressings. They can flavor them with leftover fruit so they're not throwing those uh, into the garbage. And uh, they make something that is healthier, tastes better, and doesn't contain uh, processed uh, chemicals, sugar, salt, everything else that's added in uh, most of the sauces that institutional kitchens use. And then you also suggested eliminating juice because it is expensive and contains an enormous amount of sugar. I authored healthy happy, ha healthy, happy Meals legislation that changed the default beverage for children from a sugary beverage to water, milk, or juice. Uh, it includes flavored milk, uh, to, uh, which I hope will make the borough president happy since her favorite <laughs> Uh, locally sourced item would be chocolate milk, but um, uh, I, I guess, so at Lenox Hill, if I recall, you have coffee, you have tea, you have water, and I think you have milk. Do you have any other beverages, or that's just what you offer? 
That's it. Sometimes we'll, we'll serve a flavored water with cucumber or lemon in it, but uh, sugar, uh, the, the level of sugar in uh, juice is, is really terrible, especially a lot of the organizations we train that run senior centers have many members that have diabetes and they're serving them juice three times a day. Uh, and the nutritionists sometimes think that they need to include juice because of the vitamin C, but if you're serving enough leafy greens and other menu items, you can get that in fresh produce and vegetables. I'll have you know you're now on my wife's side of things because <laughs> I, I have a small problem with orange juice. It's what folks attribute for me never getting sick, but um, I, I need that glass of orange juice every day, and whenever my daughter get sick, which now that she is in daycares every other day, uh, we tend to keep a fresh stock of oranges in the house, and uh, she actually knows how to say orange now, and she tells us when she wants the orange, so we cut it up for her, and then we take a shower because we get covered in uh, sticky <laughs> orange slices. So uh, thank you. And then to Food Bank, uh, can you tell me about just the uh, client choice model? Because I've been talking to a lot of uh, parents and teachers in the school framework and the idea of like you want to give everyone everything on their plate even if there's food waste associated with it and I imagine children are different than folks who are food insecure um, so do you see less waste where folks are not necessarily taking every single thing they're just taking the things they want or need in a client choice model Sure, so the client choice model is with food pantries, so not with a sit down plate meal. Um, but of course, when you go through a soup kitchen line, you're able to choose the items that you'd like there as well. Uh, we do see less waste. We see uh, there's just more dignity attached to it. Letting pe folks go to a grocery store and pick out the things that they would like to have. Uh, or letting folks go to a food pantry and treating it like a grocery store where you can take home the things that your, your children like to eat, you like to eat, that are relevant to your cultural background, that you have the capacity to eat, that you're, your capacity to cook at home. Uh, folks who maybe live in a shelter who aren't able to prepare all of the items that a food pantry are only able to prepare certain items. Uh, it, it provides more dignity. It provides folks a better way to pr pr provide for their families. If you'd ever like, I can uh, set up a visit to a client choice pantry for you. Uh, I, I represent the New York Common Pantry, oh, which you know. <laughs> offers a digital selection choice for a pre-bagged situation, and uh, we're also working through the Eastside Task Force for Homeless Outreach and Services to create uh, a supermarket-style uh, food pantry on East 90th Street, which is incidentally across the street from my house. So we try to do homeless services anywhere we can. Uh, and I guess one other question, just I, I guess for both of you, uh, when we talk about, uh, for both you and uh, Lenox Hill, when we talk about folks who are uh, food insecure and uh, uh, taking advantage of soup kitchens or food pantries, are these just people who are homeless? Are, who, who, what is the face of the folks who are taking advantage and in need of these services look like? Are there people from the Upper East Side, which has a certain reputation, who need access to this food? It's every type of person that needs access to emergency food. It's not necessarily homeless people. In fact, many food pantries and soup kitchens are starting to have, have different hours set aside just for working families so that the people can go to work and come in the evenings to go to their food pantry. Uh, our food pantry and soup kitchen in West Harlem uh, on 116th Street just set up Saturday hours for food pantry distribution because so many of the people we serve are working and have other obligations during the work week. Yeah, I'd, I'd also specific uh, to the Upper East Side say that both in our senior centers uh, getting meals as well as in our legal program applying for uh, SNAP benefits, we see many individuals, particularly the 10,000 older clients that we serve, uh, many of whom have lived on the Upper East Side for decades and live in the housing projects or the uh, walk-up uh, buildings that were there before the neighborhood was so fully gentrified and many of these people are living on fixed incomes and do in fact need uh, the institutional meals and uh, food pantries for food security. I, I want to thank you I think on almost everyone on this panel. Uh, you mentioned SNAP and that made me recall that 91% uh, of the seniors who qualify for SNAP in my district don't actually get it. 
Uh, this was a study done by Live On New York, and uh, we actually collaborated closely uh, with uh, Lennox Hill and uh, Hunter on uh, a project called Automatic Benefits, which would give, automatically give people their staff benefits and Medicaid benefits and child care benefits and Obama phone benefits, get them everything at once so that we use the government information we had to get people everything else they need. Thank you very much. I'll excuse this panel and we'll go up to the next panel. Uh, and if we can bring a, a fifth seat up there. Uh, first person would be Rebecca uh, Getachew from the Good Food Purchasing Campaign, Community Food Advocates. Craig Willingham from CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Chef Greg Silverman from the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Rebecca Johnson from Wellness in the Schools, WITS. And a representative from Slate Foods Incorporated. If you have not filled out a slip of paper, please do so immediately. And I love that our chef is wearing their chef weights. Do we have the representative from Slate Foods Incorporated? Uh, uh, Julia Van Loon, going once, to, okay, uh, if you did not get a chance to testify or you felt inspired watching from home, you could submit testimony within 72 hours of January 14th, 2020 uh, to contracts at bencalos.com and uh, we will uh, turn to the panel and I realized I was not good with the last panel about insisting that everyone share their food, so just go across if you can share your name, your organization, and your favorite New York food, and then you can get into your testimony. Uh, to press the red button and start over. Uh, Chef Greg Silverman, uh, Executive Director, West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Uh, I love my beats. Rebecca Johnson, Chef, Program Manager from Wellness in the Schools. And my favorite is New York kale because you can do so many things with it. Rainbow or regular? Well, it depends on what recipe. Okay. I like them both. Hello, Craig Willingham, Deputy Director for the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. And I'm going to be very generic and say New York apples. There's so many great varieties, and I haven't found one that I haven't liked. Hi everyone, my name is Ripka Yezhacho, working with Community Food Advocates as the director of the New York City Good Food Purchasing Policy Campaign. Um, ever since I was a child, I was a self-declared Miss Potato Head, so I guess I'd say potatoes. <laughs> and who would ever like to go first, you're welcome. Uh, there will be a five minute clock, but it didn't seem like we actually needed it. <laughs> you can just go down again. That's not good. Uh, Good afternoon, my name is Chef Greg Silverman. I'm the Executive Director of the West Side Campaign Against Hunger. Thank you for inviting WISCA, the West Side Campaign Against Hunger, to testify at this oversight hearing on agency procurement. I'm here today representing WISCA and our community of almost 12,000 families who come to us from across New York City to gain access to healthy food and supportive services. Founded in 1979, WISCA is the country's first supermarket-style, client-choice, multi-service food pantry and one of the largest emergency food providers in the city. We alleviate hunger by ensuring that all New Yorkers have access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and supportive services. In the last year, we provided 1.6 million pounds of food, which included over 600,000 pounds of fresh fruits and vegetables to nearly 12,000 households. Our customers are overjoyed that we serve 41% fresh produce, which is unheard of anywhere else in New York City, let alone the United States. Fresh, healthy, appetizing produce helps us battle not only short-term food insecurity, but supports the health and well-being of families in need. As the City Council speaker has said, access to adequate, nutritious food is a human right. Over the last year, WISCA, along with several other large emergency food providers in New York City, created a collective purchase initiative to help get better, healthier products at better prices for our communities. 
We worked along with Project Hospitality in Staten Island, St. John's Bread and Life in Brooklyn, New York Common Pantry on the East Side, with support from Robin Hood, Sea Change Capital, and New York Health Foundation, and with consultants Karen Karp and Partners to create this initiative as our customers and agencies demand better food for themselves, their families, and their communities. Emergency food providers, such as WISCA, push this initiative because programs such as the Emergency Food Assistance Program, EFAP, are not providing the necessary choice of products agencies and communities want or need. At WISCA, we survey our customers. They demand healthy food. They demand fresh food. They demand local food, organic food, all the same foods that any New Yorker wants and needs. Our job is to provide our customers access with dignity to a choice of the best healthy foods and supportive services. EFAP has been touted as a huge win in New York City with its $22 million of baseline in the budget. But let's be clear that the 41% fresh, healthy, nutritious produce we at WISCA distribute didn't come from EFAP. EFAP distributes $22 million of processed foods to New Yorkers in need. There's no ability within EFAP at present to give any choice of fresh product or any incentive to purchase New York State product to any New Yorkers, and this is a tragedy for the health and dignity of our New York City community. Altering EFAP to perform its efforts more like HIPNAP, the New York State Hunger Prevention and Nutrition Assistance Program, with greater choice of products and incentive for more local purchasing will help increase health of not only our customers, but the economic health of our city and region. Procurement of items, in our case via EFAP, that are locally grown or produced in New York State is not only helpful for our community, but should be viewed as necessary and in compliance with Local Law 50 and 52. These laws allow for incentivizing local purchasing and tracking of these products. Truth be told, our WISCA community of 22,000 customers care little about plans and bills. Our community cares firstly about getting healthy food for their family and feeling safe and supported. Our city, state, and federal government are not taking care of this at present. Over 73% of our customers who are part of WISCA are Latinx, many first-generation immigrants, and living in a sanctuary city like New York City, they don't feel safe or supported. Every week, customers ask to get taken off of SNAP and Medicaid due to fear about immigration issues. In New York City, these friends, neighbors, colleagues, they're refusing public sector benefits and prefer to be supported by charity. Charity cannot and will never take the place of a strong public se sector safety net. So using items such as EFAP and using Local Law 50 and 52 will help organizations like WISCA and charities to actually better perform our jobs to support our communities in need. WISCA would like to thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Our entire community look forward to helping continue to strengthen our food system as a core piece of helping make sure we provide all New Yorkers access with dignity to a choice of healthy food and supportive services. Thank you. Wellness in the Schools thanks you for this opportunity to testify about the local food procurement, Local Law 50 and 52. We thank the Manhattan Borough President, Gail Brewer, who's a friend of WITS, and also um, Council Member Kalos, and also the Council. We are going to testify on three key areas, environment, local economy, and nutrition. Number one, environment. Locally grown food protects farmlands, which are small scale over foods that are grown or produced in factory farms. These local farms attract biodiversity, giving animals, insects, and birds a place to live and thrive. Local farm food compared to imported foods have to travel a far distance from the place it was produced, accumulating what is called food miles. These food miles consume fossil fuels and valuable non-renewable resources. Reducing them helps alleviate our dependence on them, reduces air pollution, and cuts back on greenhouse gas emissions. When food is raised and grown locally, the consumer, in this case, families, better understand how and where their food is being produced. Second, local economy. Local farmers, especially those in New York State, in this case, will benefit from economic opportunities of local farming and food production. Because local farmers don't have the same transportation and distribution costs as large agricultural businesses, they can retain more of the profits from their sales and pass that on to families. 
This helps small farming businesses become more successful as more people will purchase from them. And small local farms actually create jobs, providing sustainable employment in the community. Local farm operations contribute more to the economy in tax revenue than they ever could in sales. Local farming is just benefits the bottom line. And finally, nutrition. Many people feel that local food just tastes better and it lasts longer. Local food has increased freshness and more nutrients, which has the potential of increasing New York City lunch, lunch participation just based on taste, which is where we are every day, and building the healthy bodies of New York City's school-age children who we work with. The more time that passes between farm and institution, the more nutrients are lost, especially in fresh produce, which is one of our main focuses. Locally grown fruits and vegetables contain more nutrients because they are picked at their peak freshness and are transported shorter distances. In over 140 New York City schools where our chefs work, we have the impact of helping children consume fresh fruits and vegetables every day. Just seeing the excitement of school children when they cut a fresh apple in a Wits lab cooking class or them trying kale salad for the first time is a strong indicator that fresh local foods can have an impact on a child's health for a lifetime. 26% of New York State's public plate goes to K-12 schools, impacting from a local perspective, mostly fruits, vegetables, dairy products, eggs, and locally raised meats. In our relationship with the Office for Food and Nutrition Services, as ambassadors of the alternative menu, which is more scratch cooked and more local foods, we are the ones that work with them to build the healthy bodies of our children, which we know comes from mainly these items. So for those reasons above, um, Wellness in the Schools supports uh, the Local 50 and an increase overall of local foods in New York City schools and on the plate of every child. Thank you. Should we wait? Okay. Uh, again, my name is Craig Willingham, and I'm the deputy director for the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. We are a research and action center based at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and Health Policy, and we work on a wide variety of food policy-related topic areas. By scheduling this oversight hearing on local food procurement, the Contracts Committee, together with Borough President Brewer are working to ensure that the city's purchase, uh, purchases of food not only improves the health of New Yorkers, but also supports our region's economy. Local Law 50 of 2011 encourages city agencies and vendors to purchase food grown or produced in New York State, and Local Law 52 requires the annual food metrics report to account for money spent on local or regionally sourced food. Both laws laid the foundation for improving the city's local procurement practices. And now nearly 10 years after these laws were enacted, it's time to look for additional ways to grow our local food purchasing. Here are some of our suggestions. First, Enact Bill 1660 introduced last September, which expands upon Local Law 50 by establishing the city's formal adoption of the Good Food Purchasing Program's core values, which are local economies, health, valued workforce, animal welfare, and environmental sustainability. Second, call for a review of the city's contract specification writing process in order to identify opportunities for changing its approach to, cord to contracting to level the playing field for our local food producers. Enact Bill 1664, also introduced in September, which establishes a food plan for the city and afterwards work with state and regional jurisdictions to develop a regional food equity plan, one with food procurement front and center. Require a percentage of food purchased using tax levy dollars to be locally grown and incorporate this mandate into the next iteration of the New York City food standards. And lastly, 
increase outreach and provide more resources to minority and women-owned business enterprises to help expand the number of certif certified local food suppliers and distributors. This would build a local procurement knowledge network and grow the number of suppliers for city agencies, local businesses, and organizers who are focusing on local food procurement. Our institute has worked with the Coalition for Good Food Purchasing Pro, for, the, for the coalition, with the Coalition for Good Food Purchasing Program here in New York City as a research lead, and we've also done extensive research looking at the facilitators and barriers for local food procurement in New York City, and we'll be happy to work with the council on these issues in the future. Thank you. Hello again, my name is Rivka Gaitacho. I am again working with Community Food Advocates as the director of the New York City Good Food Purchasing Policy Campaign. Uh, good afternoon, first and foremost, I'd like to thank the chair of the Contracts Committee, Councilmember Ben Kalos, and all members of the committee uh, and, council, and uh, Borough President Brewer for providing the opportunity to lend uh, our testimony to here today on this important matter. Um, I work again uh, directing the New York City Good Food Purchasing Campaign in close partnership with the Food Chain Workers Alliance, CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, and the Center for Good Food Purchasing. Um, and together we have been collectively building a robust coalition of local and national food systems experts, many of whom have been in the room or are currently still in the room. Uh, that work in the five value areas that serve as the pillars of the Good Food Purchasing Program. Again, you've heard it here today, but again, it's local economies, valued workforce, animal welfare, nutrition, and environmental sustainability. And due to this coalition's and the city's work and commitment, New York City has begun implementing the Good Food Purchasing Program and action planning, and is, in, and is also currently on track to formally codifying Good Food Purchasing Program legislation, Introduction 1660. Our coalition is currently working with Bill's sponsor, Council Member Andrew Cohen, and the Committee on Economic Development to ensure the bill language is as robust and as useful to the city and to uh, the food system as possible. Our city serves approximately 240 million meals a year across its public food serving agencies. These agencies serve some of our most vulnerable and food insecure populations, including but not limited to senior citizens, students, the homeless, incarcerated individuals, and those under medical care. That said, our purchasing power as a city, as I'm sure those of us in the room are all well aware, is astronomically tremendous. However, to even be able to assess the reach of this purchasing power, we've needed to have commitments made followed with, requ with the required follow through on the part of not only our city, but also the vendors with whom our agencies contract. There is still significant work to be done, however, to ensure the intended purposes uh, are met of, of local laws 50 and 52. Local laws 50 and 52 of 2011 are both rooted in strengthening the economic vitality of our city. Studies have suggested that increased production by local food producers helps to generate additional jobs. Research also shows that every dollar that schools spend on local foods adds between $1.60 and $3.12 to the local economy in the form of business profits, employee wages, investor dividends, interest, rents, government, government, government revenue from sales and excise taxes, etc. Simply said, there's, there are clear and positive correlations between local local procurement and the jobs and money that are infused into local economy, local communities and regions. As the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and, and Health Policies report entitled Bringing the Good Food Purchasing Program to New York City shows, there is significant precedence here in New York City for the adoption and implementation of the Good Food Purchasing Program, including local laws 50 and 52. A strong foundation exists here in New York City, which has helped to elucidate that good food purchasing would not be able to achieve its full potential without, without a commitment to thorough transparency and regular tracking of the vendors that city agencies work with. This includes, but is not limited to, exactly where these vendors are sourcing, producing and processing their food products, the names and addresses of subcontractors and suppliers, the environment, their environmental and labor violations, the, the environmental and labor violations of these entities, et cetera. Our assessment has shown that a strong bedrock that is robust and meaningful policies and practices that are followed through on ensures a successful implementation of the Good Food Purchasing Program. 
Local Laws 50 and 52 are complementary to the goals of the Good Food Purchasing Program and are some of the necessary pillars that make up said foundation. Ensuring its success also its successes means also supporting a pathway by which accessible good and local food is a reality for all members of our city, state, and region. Thank you. Thank you very much. As we uh, focus on local, uh, on good food purchasing and introduction 1666, which I'm my co-prime sponsor with Andy Cohen, um, I think it's actually worth noting about just how far ahead of her time our borough president was literally almost 10 years ago, uh, they did local law 50 and 52 to try to get this in the right direction. Uh, I want to start with a, I, I, I want to, I guess, focus with Westside Campaign Against Hunger because I think you're one of the few providers who's testified. So you, you, you have a contract with the city and you're, you have the EFAP contract. No, the Food Bank of New York has the EFAP contract. We're, we are a recipient, right, so. <coughs> Got it. And then are you getting food directly from food bank or are you using money they give you to purchase food? So that you draw down money that's allocated with, um, in food bank's website. So it's HRA money goes through, the food bank procures the food, if I'm correct, and we get it from them off their website. But it's about 15 products that we can choose from. And, are, and none of those 15 products are local? Or you just there don't know? Theoretically, could be local. I mean, I, I don't know if the grape jelly is, is local, but there's, there is no... Is the mic on? Is the mic off? No, it's on. Perfect. Oh, there, there is no incentive, as opposed to like in state contracts that we have, to purchase local products or track that. Uh, at the same time, there are no fresh products available uh, within that. It's, you know, Nutrigrain bars, grape jelly, grape juice, uh, mac and cheese, I think there's kidney beans and canned, you know, uh, a few types of canned fruit juice, fruit, fruits. Uh, and you, you also mentioned that you see people refusing and, and, and asking to be taken off SNAP and, and Medicaid. I know that this is an issue our borough president led on. She, she had materials for the first day of school that I actually participated in handing out, uh, what else can we do? Uh, you mentioned elected officials standing up, but we've, we've done information, we've done town halls, what else can we do to get folks not to be dropping off of SNAP and Medicaid? I mean, I don't think we're gonna be able to get people to drop off SNAP, right? I think the fear factor is too great, and I think the marketing from a federal level is much stronger than we can do at a city level, sadly, uh, and families are, are afraid, and we see that every day, and you know, we give people the facts, but we, we can't tell someone, no, you're not gonna come off of SNAP, which means we end up needing to provide more food to more people, because people are more dependent on charity as opposed to the public sector, which I, I guess I bring those two pieces up to, to sort of hope to influence even more why it's so essential to have the best food for these customers, because they're gonna be refusing federal dollars, and so they're gonna be needing our local support, and the more we can do to get better food in, in their bodies and for their families, uh, it's gonna become even more essential. Thank you. With regard to this CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute, your testimony included a, a reference to the General, General Municipal Law uh, 104. Are, are you open to working with uh, some of the other folks around how we can get around state laws to uh, accomplish more preference for local food? Absolutely, and uh, to date we've been working closely with our partners in the New York City Good Food Purchasing Program Coalition to look at the various ways that we can address this issue and the limitations that come from GML 104. Uh, it, it's something that we, we think that there's a possible solution on the horizon, but just getting enough people in the, in the right rooms to have a discussion about what can be done is, is likely the next step. Uh, you were the only one to testify about uh, the uh, Minority and Women Owned Business Enterprise Program, MWBE, uh, and this is a, a preference provided under the law because women and people of color who own businesses face a, uh, uh, they face discrimination when trying to gain and do business with the city, and so the MWBE term is out of the 90s, it is now 
frankly offensive, but it is still a term of art. Uh, can you tell me about uh, MWBEs that you know of in the local food supply market and what we can do to get them, what we could do to work with you to get folks registered uh, and, and even make sure that they're actually being included in the disparities report. Uh, I'm, I'm not even sure. I guess it would be under the sup supplies. So, so, but this is this is something important. So, I guess could you elaborate a little bit more about what you've seen? Uh, sadly, very few to none. I mean, and it doesn't. Uh, it's not exclusive to food distributors or food manufacturers. It also extends to. Uh, local food producers working in agriculture throughout New York State. The numbers represented by you know, women and, and other minorities are, are extremely small. What we see is the power of cities like New York and others that are looking to make a, some sort of change in this area. We see the power of the public dollar to be able to spark both interest in communities that are currently underrepresented in food manufacturing, food growing, food processing, and using those, those public dollars as an attractor to swell the ranks of uh, food producers with people who are currently not showing up in the system. Would you be open to gathering folks together uh, who might be interested? Uh, because you, you said zero to none that this, does anyone else on the panel have ideas on whether or not there are uh, businesses that are owned by women or people of color who might be able to get, who, who are either already certified or could be certified so that they could get the MWBE preference when bidding on these contracts? You're, you're nodding, so do you want to? I mean, there, there, there are people out in New York, throughout New York State, who, um, who have been producing food for generations and have as Craig was saying, have been historically left out of the marketplace. And so it's not that they're not there, it, they are, it's just that they've, by virtue of the way that the, even the RFPs have been set up have, and so many other structural barriers have not been able to even compete. And so, you know, even in thinking about um, resources like the Central Brooklyn Food Hub, which has been getting resources infused into it to really offer a, a, a local solution, a hyper-local solution to getting these folks into the marketplace, I'd say is one of many opportunities that we can look at um, as a city to get more of these contractors into, uh, into contracting with, ag with city agencies. So, uh would community food advocates and CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute be opening, open to working with us to identify providers who already exist but aren't getting the MWBE preference or people who would be interested in entering uh, the food economy and we can bring uh, SBS and uh, the, off the mayor's office of MWBE to the table to see what kind of partnerships and of course our borough president would be invited and anyone watching at home uh, who uh, has tried to bid and found that the RFPs made it very difficult for them. Uh, or anyone who'd like to participate who isn't currently at the table, you can email contracts at bencalos.com. But would you be open to that, would both of you? Absolutely. Yes, I would be too. We would be too. <laughs> that, 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 is, that is fine. Um, <laughs> and I, I guess uh, for, for wellness in, in the schools, uh, you weren't lying about liking kale, kale like it made it into your testimony. So, no, it's uh, truthful. Uh, one, of, one of the challenges, and I think something that the borough president spoke to is just scratch cooking. And you, you are literally dealing with schools. A lot of the schools in my district don't have kitchens. Uh, we have warming stations um, and actually just if I reflect that in my head, I think the schools uh, in my district that serve overwhelmingly students of color are the schools that have warming kitchens, uh, war warming stations, and the schools that serve almost entirely students uh, who are Caucasian have kitchens. And so I, I see within my own district, it's something we brought up to DOE, uh, a disparity in access to food. I also see that uh, uh, some schools in my district and why we did the local law report that I referenced before, the reason we 
want to know what they're serving is because some of my schools have fresh fruit and the schools that serve students almost entirely of color get canned food. Uh, so I guess how can we deal with that challenge, even assuming that we can get more local food, uh, what do we do about the scratch piece of it? Well, that would be one reason why we're not in those schools that have warming kitchens, because we work directly with the cooks, helping them learn how to make scratch meals. Yeah. Uh, we are ambassadors of the alternative menu. The alternative menu basically means no chicken nuggets, no uh, mozzarella sticks. It's what we call feeding kids real food. In that case, there are some canned items. Um, to illustrate, there is a dish, which is a bean dish that comes in a plastic bag. Um, and then there is the veggie chili, which is made from multiple cans of beans, but it adds vegetables and it adds seasonings. So you wouldn't, as a chef, necessarily call it 100% scratch, but there is some scratch cooking there. So the work that we're doing is to get the school community excited about embracing um, fresh foods, which most are. I had a PTA meeting this morning that went on for an hour, and most of it was questions about the menu from parents. Um, but not just getting them excited, but actually creating a wellness environment so that when we bring our chefs in, when we bring them into the kitchen, the Office of Food and Nutrition Services cooks are more open to working directly with us. But it really depends on what um, we say DOE or OFNS is able to bring. There are days when sometimes they're expecting a particular item, but it de depends on the purveyor, right? Whether they get that item or not. The menus are obviously public and can be seen. We are definitely advocating for more scratch cooks. And as you can see from this, the people we hire are, le we hire legitimate chefs because that's what we want. But we do need the product to be there in order to be able to do that. Uh, thank you, and, and I, I will say that if you've ever seen me in, in Chef's Whites, I, I'm faking it till I make it. We do a partnership with Grow NYC called Cooking with Kalos, uh, where I go to the green markets in my district. We promote it uh, in our newsletter to, I think, tens of thousands of residents, and uh, no one's ever there to, to, to watch me cook. They're just there to eat food and get constituent service, but... Uh, no, that's a great help because it influences <laughs> the community. It influences the school. We have chefs that we bring in from restaurants to do something we call a cafe day where they actually make a scratch dish and everybody in the school gets to try it. But we also connect them with the school cooks to elevate that level that what they're doing is so important. But as I said, you know, we can only work with what we've been given. I was a little concerned, though, about um, the borough president talking about chocolate milk being one of her favorites, because we're working so hard to get schools to choose water and unflavored milk. So uh, that would be something that we would want your help with or some sort of understanding about that. Uh I, I make no apologies for the borough president. What I will say is just that um, if you are choosing between a sugary beverage and a flavored milk product, that flavored milk product does have nutritional value of some yes. sort. But when we did the hearing, we did hear from parents who said, what are you going to do about getting uh, sugared beverages out of our schools? And in particular, a lot of parents were focused on chocolate milk. and. Uh, if somebody's watching at home and, and wants to get chocolate milk out of their school, uh, it's up to each school. Uh, I think you just have to have two milk products offered per school. Uh, so parents are welcome to work with their school leadership team or the PTA uh, to have their school become a school. And I believe if you don't have chocolate milk, you can do something like you can have skim and whole milk. And so uh, before I met my wife, I, I loved to drink whole milk. And uh, now I have adjusted and learned to love uh, uh, fat-free milk. 
Uh, meanwhile, we, we have a 23-month-old daughter at home, and she gets to have the, the, the full whole milk. Um, so I'm, there's a little bit of jealousy there. But, uh, I, <laughs> well, the parents will be happy to hear that. They absolutely. know what to do now. Thank you very much. Yep. Uh, does anyone else wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, uh, if you have testimony or questions, feel free to submit them to the record. Uh, within 72 hours of January 14th, 2020. I want to thank everyone for being here. I want to thank the borough president for passing this law in 2011 uh, and her policy director for the great work on this hearing. And uh, it is hereby adjourned.